Welcome everyone to Wednesday Night at the Lab. I'm Tom Zinnan. I work here at the UW-Madison Biotechnology Center. I also work for the Division of Extension and Wisconsin 4-H. And on behalf of those folks and our other co-organizers, PBS Wisconsin, the Wisconsin Alumni Association, and the UW-Madison Science Alliance, thanks again for coming to Wednesday Night at the Lab. We do this every Wednesday night, 50 times a year. Tonight, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Tony Goldberg of the School of Veterinary Medicine. Professor Goldberg was born in New York City in Manhattan. He went to West Hill High School in Stamford, Connecticut. Then he studied biology and English at Amherst College in Amherst, Massachusetts. And then he got his PhD at Harvard in physical anthropology. Then he went to the University of Illinois to get his uh, veterinary degree and also his master's degree in epistemology. And then he's been here at the University of Wisconsin-Madison for quite some time. Tonight, he's going to get to talk to us about something very germane, given the coronavirus outbreak of the last six or seven weeks. Uh, he'll be talking with us about discovering new pathogens and wildlife from Wisconsin and beyond. Please join me in welcoming Tony Goldberg to Wednesday Night at the Lab. Well, thank you, Tom, for the kind introduction and the invitation, and thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, this is a timely talk. I guess uh, back when I was younger, let's see if I can get this working. Maybe not. I'll just do the manual version. Back, back when I was younger, <laughs> computers worked. <laughs> wow, there goes my joke. Oh, something's going on. Let's see. Wow. Okay, let's try this again. Erwin, do you want to start over? Um, yeah, why don't we? Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. And do you want me to do the intro or do you want to splice it in? Why don't you just, just toss it to him? Give him the. <laughs> Hmm. <laughs> All right, sorry about that. You guys want the microphone? Thank you. Okay, hang. Still not working. Let's. All right, I'm going to do a hot switch. Hang on just a second. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Technology. through the VGA then. And you want to see if the advances are right? Got some holy water back in the. <laughs> got it. Okay, it's working. Does it work? And it's, yeah. It's going back and forth? Yeah. Okay. The whole thing? <sighs> if I can remember my Sorry. Lines. Oh, wait a minute. I got to get the. Uh... Can't use just any old thing here. Okay. <clears throat> 
Yep, once every 14 years, whether you need to or not. So for the folks at home, we just had some technical difficulties, which you were probably watching. So we're going to cue this up so we can get a clean recording for uh, PBS Wisconsin. Sorry about this, folks. 51 times a year. <laughs> Welcome, everyone, to Wednesday Night at the Lab. I'm Tom Zinnan. I work here at the UW-Madison Biotechnology Center. I also work for the Division of Extension and Wisconsin 4-H. And on behalf of those folks and our other core organizers, PBS Wisconsin, the Wisconsin Alumni Association, and the UW-Madison Science Alliance, thanks again for coming to Wednesday Night at the Lab. We do this every Wednesday night, 50 times a year. Tonight it's my pleasure to introduce to you Tony Goldberg of the School of Veterinary Medicine. He was born in New York City in Manhattan. He went to high school at the West Hill High School in Stamford, Connecticut. And then he studied biology and English at Amherst College in Massachusetts. He got his PhD at Harvard in physical anthropology and then went to the University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana to get his DV, uh, Doctor of Veterinary Medicine and his master's degree in epidemiology. Tonight he's here to talk with us about something quite germane given the coronavirus outbreak. The title of his talk is Discovering New Pathogens in Wildlife from Wisconsin and Beyond. Please join me in welcoming Tony Goldberg to Wednesday Night at the Lab. Well, thanks very much, Tom, for the invitation and to everyone for coming tonight. Um, back when many of us were younger, our relationship with nature was quite different from it is today. It was a, an enchanted kingdom of sorts, but clearly that's changed. <laughs> we live in a different world, uh, a world in which our relationship to nature is more microbial than magical. This New York Times Magazine uh, illustration shows us connected to the natural world through a uh, highway of deadly pathogens. So it is indeed timely that I'm giving this talk today because we are in the middle, in the middle of yet another pandemic, this one caused by a novel coronavirus from Wuhan, China. This phenomenon really is, is uh, is new to science in a way. When I was doing my graduate studies, this idea of emerging infectious disease really was not on the scene. This is a graph of the frequency of that phrase in the medical literature by year since 1980. And you could see it didn't really even figure in to science before the early 1990s. And then it sort of taken off in this uh, upward trend. I was doing my graduate work then, and I'm pretty sure this can be attributed to the remarkable story of the origins of AIDS. That in the early 1990s, we discovered that AIDS was a virus that originated from chimpanzees in Central Africa. And really, that decade between the early 90s and the early 2000s filled in the elements of that story. So that, to me, the HIV pandemic is the mother of all pandemics and the mother of all diseases of zoonotic origin. So chimps, very important. And that's why, even though this is a talk about Wisconsin, I'd like to start in Africa, where I've done work for many years, including during my PhD years, in a national park in Uganda called Kibali, which is famous for its primates, and most notably, its chimpanzees, as shown by these lovely photographs by my colleague Ronan Donovan. Um, the chimps of Kibali are famous and have been studied uh, almost as long as the chimpanzees at Jane Goodall cited Gombe. And they're wonderful creatures, but they suffer problems. We recently did an analysis of causes of death over the decades of this chimpanzee population and found that respiratory disease, which was a little surprising to us, accounted for over half of the documented deaths during the time that we've been able to follow these chimps daily. And this came home to me in 2013 when I was there during a remarkable epidemic of deadly respiratory disease where we lost five of the 50 chimps in the community, shown here. Um, and I'd known many of these chimps my whole career, uh, like Stout, for example, charged me when I was a graduate student. And I'll never forgive him for that, but he still, I still miss him. Um, 
the course of the epidemic was this. There were three waves beginning in about February of 2013 and ending in about September. And um, being there was very scary because when chimpanzees are, are coughing and sneezing and dying, you're not sure what's killing them. So in situations like that, you have to be very careful by wearing personal protective gear, sort of the moon suits. This is, uh, th this is again, me looking like a superhero thanks to Ronan's fabulous photography. But um, you have to be very careful. So we were investigating this outbreak, collecting biological samples for analysis, analysis back in the lab. So what do you do if you don't know what's killing wildlife? It turns out many years ago, there wasn't much you could do. There were traditional diagnostics. You could say, well, maybe it's this bacteria, maybe it's this virus, and you'd send the sample off to a lab, and you'd get a yes or no answer back. These days, things have really changed, and that's going to be a theme that goes throughout this talk. Namely, we can rely on techniques now that are broadly known as metagenomic techniques, as shown in that figure. Basically, we can take our chicken or rat or human or swabs from a sick chimpanzee and randomly sequence millions upon millions of molecules of DNA or RNA in those samples and then feed all those sequences into a computer that will tell us what's there. Most of it will be your salamander or your person or your chimp, but hiding in there, kind of the proverbial needle in a haystack, will be the thing you're looking for. And you don't have to have any prior knowledge of what it is. So these techniques are sometimes called agnostic or unbiased, and they're very powerful. They're the future of infectious disease diagnostics. So we did this. This is something that, uh, at the time, um, I, I had just begun to do in my lab. Now we do it routinely. And out popped a remarkable answer. It turns out that these chimpanzees had been dying of a human pediatric virus called rhinovirus C. Uh, rhinovirus C is the most common cause of the common cold in people worldwide. And th this is a great story about UW-Madison, because as soon as I realized what the culprit was, I only had to glance out my window down the street to realize that Ann Palmenberg, the world expert in rhinovirus C, was right there within walking distance. So I jogged over to her office. You know, that's the kind of place this is. Um, it turns out what these chimps had, and this particular isolate was from Betty, was a very typical C45 strain of this virus. The, the bottom line is there was nothing special about it. It wasn't a mutated chimp version of the virus. It wasn't some strange out of nowhere virus. It's just the sort of thing that you would find circulating in kids in the, in the hospitals here in Wisconsin during cold season. So why? Why in the world was this happening? Again, due to the expertise of my collaborators like Ann Palmenberg and Jim Gern in the pediatrics department, we happen to know quite a bit about how this virus latches on to hosts. This is, this is actually an atomic structure, that's how detailed we can get these days, of the binding complex of rhinovirus C and its host cell receptor. And I don't understand this either, but um, what I do know is that we know the receptor quite well. It's called CDHR3. Uh, and what we know about this receptor is that it's critical for human health. It's, there, there are two versions of it. The, the most common version actually resists infection with rhinovirus C and other infectious agents in people. But if you have this rare version, if you're a person, called the risk allele with a single amino acid change at a single position of the protein, you're highly susceptible to rhinovirus C infection. And interestingly, you have a tenfold increased risk of having asthma. So if anyone's ever done 23andMe, it's one of the most informative loci in 23andMe because most people who have asthma will realize they have this variant CDHR3 locus, allele rather. Um, so what we did is we genotyped the chimps at this field site in Uganda, and we looked at chimpanzee genomes from across Africa. And we found that every single one of those chimps had the allele of this gene that makes people highly susceptible to the virus and highly susceptible to asthma. The, ba the basic idea here is that we have evolved with viruses like rhinovirus C, and we have adapted to them, genetically in this case, whereas chimps have not. 
They've only recently been exposed to these common cold pediatric viruses of people, and they're exquisitely susceptible. So all chimpanzees everywhere are genetically susceptible to rhinovirus C infection, and as it turns out, to a suite of other human respiratory pathogens. This concept is actually called reverse zoonoses. I think most people here have heard of zoonoses, diseases that go from animals to people, but it's not as well known that there are plenty of diseases that go from people to animals, and they present a global threat to uh, domestic animals and wildlife, and there have been a few papers written about this. I wish I had more time to tell you all the interesting facts about this particular outbreak, but one thing I can't really tell you yet is how this happens. We don't know exactly how these viruses get from people to chimps. There are plausible mechanisms. There are tourists who visit these sites, people like me, uh, people in local villages. Chimps will sometimes leave the forest to go raid crops, and they'll come into close contact with people and their, the places where they live. So there's all these different possible ways, and we're, we're looking at that now. But I wanted to start the talk with this story to kind of reinforce the idea that infectious diseases don't care which direction they go in. We're concerned about human health because we're humans, but they're just as happy to go in the other direc direction. And they're just as happy to go to other places, like Wisconsin. So uh, this is a group of nine photos that the USGS puts out on emerging diseases and wildlife, and we have six of the nine in our state. So we are not by any means shielded from this, this phenomenon. I think a lot of people in Wisconsin are aware of a few of them. The two big ones being uh, Lyme disease and uh, chronic wasting disease. So Lyme disease, of course, is a huge problem here. We are a real epicenter for Borrelia burgdorferi, the bacterium that causes Lyme disease, a disease that is transmitted by ticks. Um, and in fact, we have a Midwest Center of Excellence in Vector-Borne Disease here, funded by the CDC, that specializes in Lyme disease. Uh, chronic wasting disease, we don't know if it's zoonotic yet, but it certainly is emerging, and we're uh, certainly aware of the spread of chronic wasting disease among the deer herd of Wisconsin. It's also a disease of major concern. But these two diseases that get a lot of popular press are not the only ones in Wisconsin. So I want to go through a few other ones that you may not have heard of, starting with the disease of fish. Um, one of the reasons I moved to Wisconsin is because I like to fish. So when this disease popped onto the scene, I became very interested in studying it. It's called viral hemorrhagic septicemia. And it's actually caused by an invasive species, an invasive virus. If, if you do go fishing, you might see these signs posted at the rivers that the DNR puts out to inform people about it. But um, it started out as uh, a disease that was popping up in association with fish kills in Lake Michigan and Lake Winnebago in the early 2000s. And this was a big issue because fishing is a huge industry in Wisconsin. It's responsible for $2.3 billion of annual economic impact. Um, and we are third behind Florida and Michigan in the number of non-resident anglers who buy fishing licenses in the United States. Uh, so that's everybody from Chicago coming up in the summer on the weekends. Um, and you know, we, we, we catch and keep a lot, a lot of fish. And this virus came in 2003 to the Great Lakes region and started causing massive fish kills in a number of fish species, and it turned into a major regulatory issue. It shut down for a while the interstate transport, transport of bait fish. So there is a thriving bait fish industry in Wisconsin and surrounding states. And USDA came down and, and shut that down. Um, it's, believe it or not, it's related to rabies virus. So fish get rabies-like viruses too. Rhabdoviruses are all over the place. And it causes this hemorrhagic disease and massive fish kills. So some people in my lab joke that we should be calling it fishbola. It's, it's like that. Um, the first thing we did with this virus, and that's me trying not to get seasick on Lake Winnebago, was to um, develop a new test for the virus. Because before we did this, it was impossible to test for this virus without killing the fish. We developed a blood test that you can take a blood sample and then test it for antibodies. And what was interesting is when we applied this test to Lake Winnebago, sort of the ground zero 
of viral hemorrhagic septicemia in Wisconsin, we were able to show that the virus persisted even when there were no fish kills, that it sort of hung out at low levels in the lake from year to year, even when we were seeing nothing on the surface of the water. Now, you don't know what's going on under the water, but uh, we found lots of fish with antibodies to the virus, and the antibodies were going up and going down, and we even found one fish, typhoid fish Mary, who was a 24-year-old freshwater drum collected in 2012 uh, that was positive for antibodies and had active live virus in the tissues, in spleen and kidney. So this was a carrier fish that was swimming around Lake Winnebago ready to see the next epidemic. We're, what we're doing right now, and I don't have results for you yet, is to go around the state with the DNR and test these four species of game fish from the water bodies shown here and, uh, and in Michigan where there have been several kills of, caused by this virus. And we're hoping to map the distribution of this emerging pathogen in the state of Wisconsin. But what we realized when traveling around the state of Wisconsin is that we would encounter fish kills or stories about fish kills or reports of fish kills to the DNR that were not viral hemorrhagic septicemia and were just stuck on the shelf because they couldn't figure out what they were. So we launched a side project informed by some of the uh, chimp work I'd been doing that I like to call the, the Bassomatic Project. <laughs> For those of you who remember the old SNL skit, um, so basically, find a fish, grind a fish, sequence a fish, and figure out what pathogens are in it. Um, and guess what? We have been finding loads of new undiscovered viruses in the fish of Wisconsin. For example, largemouth bass rheovirus, which we published a couple of years ago, which um, is a divergent virus, again, new to science, that's most closely related to a pretty serious viral disease of farmed salmon, but had never been found in a bass before, let alone in Wisconsin. This thing is known from the Pacific Northwest in Norway. So that was surprising. Um, and we're working on other viruses, like a virus of brown trout that popped up, and a virus from some of our, uh, some private hatcheries around the state that's actually related to really nasty human pathogens with names like Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever. So we don't, we don't know what these things are doing. And fish, have fun, eat fish, it's fine. But um, it's surprising when you start to look just how much you find, uh, especially in cases like this where you have animals dying of unknown causes. And that's, that's really important for people in Wisconsin because we love our animals. Uh, at the School of Veterinary Medicine, I think we have somebody studying the health of every one of these animals except for trilobites because they're extinct. But, um, you know, we are, we are a state that loves the outdoors. We are a state that loves our wildlife, our pets, and our livestock. So, um, you know, th these things are upsetting to us. They, they strike not only at the health of our animals, but sort of at our core values as residents of Wisconsin. Not on this uh, photo, on, on this poster, is one of the most iconic of species around here, the bald eagle. That's not a great shot. Um, that, that went viral. Um, so the bald eagle is obviously an iconic species of bird. It's, um, it's important, I think, to realize that the, the founding fathers did not discover the magnificence of the bald eagle. It was revered by Native American cultures for millennia prior to the, uh, the arrival of Europeans on North America. But um, it was chosen as the symbol of the United States of America by the Second Continental, Con Continental Congress in 1782, and it appears on the Great Seal of the United States. Now, I'd like to address and dispel a myth. Benjamin Franklin did not want the turkey to be the national bird of the United States, as some people have said. Th this is indeed an urban legend. Um, that's, that would have been our seal if he had. Um, <laughs> but Benjamin Franklin uh, did not like the choice of the bald eagle. That is true. He wrote about that. Because this is how we think of bald eagles, as these magnificent hunters of the sky who fish and you know, swoop down and are majestic. But they're actually dirty thieves. Um, 
they engage in this behavior that's called kleptoparasitism, or sometimes piracy, where they mostly make a living by stealing food from other species. In this case, a fox has been lucky enough to catch a nice rabbit, and here comes the eagle, swoops down, grabs the rabbit, and the, the, rabbit and the fox is going crazy because he just stole dinner. So bald eagles are notorious for this behavior, which made Benjamin Franklin not like them, <laughs> and call it, he actually called them a bird of bad moral character <laughs> because they don't make an honest living. So you know, he, was, he was quite the natural historian. So little history on the bald eagle in our country. And of course, if we're going to talk about bald eagles in the United States, we can't forget Rachel, Car Rachel Carson and Silent Spring, where um, she exposed the deleterious effects of DDT on uh, eggshells. And because of this chemical and other, other challenges, bald eagles at one point were reduced in the lower 48 states to only about 400 breeding pairs. They've since rebounded to 16,000 or more since last count. So this is a uh, Fish and Wildlife Service timeline of the path to recovery from bald eagles. It started before Rachel Carson, but really her, her uh, writings uh, inspired the public to take serious action and through a series of legislative changes and, um, and enforcement, bald eagles were brought back from the, from the brink of extinction. That is the same for Wisconsin as everywhere. 25 years ago, that was the uh, distribution of breeding pairs of bald eagles in Wisconsin. In 2017, it was that, and it's even higher today, so we are awash with eagles, which is great. But eagles are not uh, without threats. So there are lots of things that kill eagles these days. This is from a nice publication out of the uh, National Wildlife Health Center here in Madison, which shows that many eagles suffer poisoning if they scavenge carcasses that maybe farmers will leave out to poison carnivores. Uh, trauma, this is if they're hungry and they're by the side of a road, they might get hit by a car. Electrocution, landing on electric wires like that poor eagle there. People still shoot them for reasons I don't understand, and some of them just don't make it because they, they, uh, there's natural selection out there, and they'll starve each winter because they haven't learned how to hunt properly. Uh, among infectious diseases, we really don't know very much about eagle infections. There have been scattered reports of different infectious diseases that have afflicted eagles over the years, a case here, a case there. Uh, the exception to that is West Nile virus, which we know when it arrived in 1999 in the US did take a toll on bald eagles. And in fact, they're exquisitely susceptible. This is a paper by my colleague Han Ip on the right there at, at the National Wildlife Health Center who showed that bald eagles in Utah were actually getting infected with West Nile virus, not by mosquitoes, which is how West Nile is usually transmitted, but by eating infected eared grebes. So they're so susceptible they can get it by eating another infected species. Um, so that's the one we knew about. Um, Ron Seeley in 2005 wrote this brief report in uh, the Wisconsin State Journal about this strange syndrome of bald eagles that had baffled scientists. I don't know, I've never felt more baffled than when I became a scientist. That's what journalists like to say, you know, such and such baffles scientists. Um, well, we were baffled for a while, but there was this, there was this um, syndrome that had been noticed for decades in Wisconsin called Wisconsin River Eagle Syndrome. Eagles had been dying mysterious deaths. They would be okay one day, and then they would just go into seizures and vomit and be deathly ill the next day and die. And it only seemed to happen along the lower Wisconsin Riverway. So um, Wisconsin River Eagle Syndrome, they looked, my colleagues at the DNR and the Wildlife Health Center looked at all the things you might expect. Every toxin under the sun, all the known infections, couldn't find a thing. The images on the right are what a typical liver looks like under a microscope from a an eagle that has died of Wisconsin River Eagle Syndrome. These are kind of non-specific changes, but these big vacuoles, these holes in the liver cells, are what you would typically see in this case, although they couldn't really figure out what was causing it. So I guess when you've got a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Uh, we decided to take this one off the shelf and see if we could shed some light on it using metagenomic diagnostics. In other words, take the tissues from these sick birds 
put them through our uh, fancy DNA sequencing apparatus, and let the computer tell us what in there was not a bald eagle. We did that and came out with a really surprising finding. We discovered a new virus that we have called bald eagle hepasivirus. It's shown there on the right with the eagle soaring off the screen. It is part of a group of viruses that contain two genera, pegivirus and hepasivirus. You probably have never heard of the pegiviruses before. They don't really cause disease. But you probably have heard of the hepasiviruses because that is the genus that contains human hepatitis C virus, which was interesting because the end stage of infection with hepatitis C virus looks very much like what those eagle livers looked like. So we had a relative of human hepatitis C in a bird that nobody had any idea it would be. Uh, and just about the same time, there was a group from China that published a similar virus in domestic ducks. But uh, that was, it wasn't clear what it was doing. So we found this very interesting, very suspicious virus in bald eagles in Wisconsin. And we kind of went crazy with analyses because we're trying to understand it. We, th what, what this graph is showing is we constructed a phylogenetic tree or a family tree of eagles themselves because we had their livers and we could do molecular uh, systematics, molecular phylogenetics on the birds and the viruses that were infecting each of those birds on the right. And we tried to say, OK, are these family trees matching up at all? And the answer is no. So we thought maybe that this was some virus that was being transmitted from mother to offspring or father to offspring, vertically transmitted from eagle to eagle and was just sitting there in the eagles. That doesn't seem to be the case. This argues against that and suggests they're getting it in some other way. So we looked across the coterminous United States from Florida to Washington State, which is, the, which is um, where we found these viruses in eagles. And we tried to ask, well, is there any effect of geographic distance on the genetics of the eagles or their viruses? In the case of the eagles, it's clearly no. Eagles are eagles are eagles genetically, no matter where they're from, which isn't particularly surprising because there are only 400 pairs of them back in the 1960s. So they went through a severe population <laughs> bottleneck. You wouldn't expect a lot of genetic diversity. But the viruses showed a very different pattern. The viruses from those same eagles clustered into tight little groups. And the farther apart in space they were, the more different they were genetically, called isolation by distance. So what we think is going on is that the virus is being maintained through local cycles of transmission. And it is not necessarily being carried around by eagles. So basically, we don't know how this virus is being transmitted, but uh, it's decoupled, in a way, from its hosts. What this graphic shows is a bit of the epidemiology and what, what still makes us very suspicious. It turns out we found this virus in eagles all over the United States, so not just in Wisconsin. But eagles from Wisconsin were nine times more likely to harbor this virus than eagles from anywhere else. And if we only counted eagles from counties where Wisconsin River Eagle Syndrome had ever been diagnosed, there were 14 more times more. 14 times more likely to have been infected with bald eagle hepasivirus than eagles from elsewhere. So where we are right now is sort of in the murky waters of emerging infectious disease. We found an interesting virus in an interesting species infected or suffering an interesting disease. But we, we are moving towards testing the idea that this is actually the cause or not. It could be the cause. It could be an incidental finding, but a very interesting virus in an iconic species. And I didn't realize until I had done this work and it was published just how popular eagles are, because this went viral a little bit. Um, it got covered all over the popular press. I think I, I was unprepared for it, because as a scientific finding, it was not definitive. It was suggestive and interesting to me and to virologists and ornithologists. But uh, the popular, popular press really picked up on it. And I think the reason for that, as you can imagine, is that we love our eagles. They are deeply ingrained in the national psyche. They're all American. And here in Wisconsin, they, they are part of our own iconography as well. So um, everybody loves eagles, is what I learned. So getting back to the broader question here, 
emerging infectious diseases. I don't want to give you the impression that all emerging infections or all new infections are viruses. These days, listening to stories about Wuhan coronavirus, you would think so, or Ebola, but they're not. There are some weird ones out there. So I want to return to my roots a little bit and talk about apes in Wisconsin. Yes, there are apes in Wisconsin uh, at zoos. So this was an interesting case that came about at a, a little earlier than what I just talked about with the eagles, involving an orangutan at the Milwaukee County Zoo named Mahal. I don't know if anyone remembers this, this particular orangutan, but it was a, a great story. He was born in Colorado at the Cheyenne Mountain Zoo, and he was rejected by his birth mother. This happens sometimes. We don't know exactly why, but uh, he was actually flown on a private jet from Colorado to Milwaukee and introduced to his surrogate mom who took to him right away and raised him like her own and it was this wonderful story of hope and redemption and, and second chances and they even wrote a children's book about it, Little Mahal and the Big Search for a Real Mom. You know, it doesn't get more heart-wrenching than that and he died suddenly and unex unexpectedly at five and a half years old and all we knew was that that was a severe and acute respiratory disease of unknown cause. Um, these are, again, for some reason I'm on livers today, but this is Mahal's liver uh, showing these cysts, which are not normal, and inside some of the cysts, these, these cells that are not orangutan cells. They're some other thing that has infected him. And try as the zoo vets might, they could not figure out under the microscope what this was. They sent it around the world to experts in parasitology and, fung and fungi and all these different things. So I got a call from Annette Gendron, my colleague who recently retired. Um, could this be a, an obscure primate pathogen called hepatocystis, which makes cysts in the liver, hepatocystis, liver cysts, uh, which I had been studying in Africa, that same site I told you about with the chimps. So I told her, well, it could be, so uh, let me run a quick test and I'll give you the answer and I'll be home by dinner and you can, you know, you can say what's going on. Never say that <laughs> because I ran the test and it was negative, but I'd already shot my mouth off and told Annette and the folks at the Milwaukee County Zoo that I was going to solve the case. So I was left, for, for uh, those of you who do infectious disease work with a very unenviable list of differential diagnoses, basically anything with a nucleus. Um, <laughs> so this was in the early days, but we adopted this technology that I've told you about a few times now for pathogen hunting, where we took uh, Mahal's tissues and put them on the machine and said, okay machine, tell us what is not orangutan. Most of it was orangutan, 97%, uh, but seven of the sequences that we got off of the machine that were not orangutan actually matched Tinea solium, which is the pork tapeworm. Now, Mahal did not have the pork tapeworm, but it allowed us to zero in on this particular branch of the tapeworm evolutionary tree, the Taeniidae, which contained at the time two genera Tanium, tania and Echinococcus, which anyone in veterinary medicine will be intimately familiar with. Uh, so that was enough information to let us design more specific tests and figure out, did Mahal die of Tania or Echinococcus? And the answer was no, neither, because we found Mahal's tapeworm to be something in between the two that I show here clustering with this thing I've abbreviated V. Right at the time we were doing this, we uh, saw in the literature a publication proposing a new genus of Tania tapeworm called Versteria, named after Anna Verster, a famous South African tapeworm biologist. You learn these things. Um, and it turned out we had stumbled on the first primate infection uh, with a tapeworm of the genus Versteria which was really fascinating. So we had no idea Versteria was in Wisconsin, and we happened to find it in an orangutan in Milwaukee. It doesn't get any weirder than that. Can't make this stuff up. Um, so what actually happened? It's a little confusing, because when I say tapeworm, you think of the long, tapey thing, or maybe you've seen these in your cat or dog's poop, and you, you, know, you run screaming to the vet. Um, so this type of tapeworm, in a normal situation, that, that long tapewormy thing lives inside the intestines of a dog or a cat or a carnivore. 
and they deposit that onto the in environment through these little packets of eggs called proglottids, which then release the eggs into the soil, and along comes a mouse and picks those up off of the soil, eats them, and those go into the tissues of the mouse and just wait. And maybe they'll even slow the mouse down a little bit. And then they just wait for a cat to eat that mouse, and then those eggs hatch inside the cat and migrate to the gut and become the long tapey thing again. That's a tapeworm life cycle. What had happened in the case of Mahal the orangutan is he inadvertently played the role of the mouse. This can happen sometimes. It's called cyst cystocercosis, where an animal will ingest the eggs, and the eggs will hatch, and kind of not know where they are. They know they're in some animal, but it's the wrong animal, so they grow out of control. And they form cysts, and they can grow out of control and kill animals. This, hap this can happen in, in many species. But Mahal loved to eat dirt, as any good orangutan does, because it helps with the digestion. And he must have picked this up from the soil. So we conducted a two-year investigation as to the origins of this thing by going all over the United States to places where trappers and, and hunters and, uh, and pest control people were collecting weasels. Because in Europe, the closest relative of this thing lives in weasels. And we dissected so many weasels. And we wound up finding a few adult specimens of this worm showing that this genus does, in fact, live in weasels. Um, we found one in an ermine from Wisconsin, which got us very excited, in Horicon Marsh, actually. Um, but that particular one was not very closely related to the variant that killed Mahal. But uh, a colleague of mine in Colorado at the, uh, at the Denver, Denver Museum gave us a, a, an ermine that had one of these tapeworms that was an almost identical match to the one that killed Mahal the orangutan in Milwaukee. And what's really interesting about that is if you recall, Mahal was born in Colorado and flew on the private jet to Milwaukee. So we think that Mahal picked this thing up in Colorado by eating the eggs of a tapeworm from an ermine and flew with the quiescent infection on a private jet to Milwaukee, where for some reason five years later it started to grow out of control and kill them. So, you know, the, this this is the lesson for emerging infectious diseases. They're, the ways they get around are virtually unpredictable. I should say that I'm very proud of this study because in both of our publications we said at the end, hey, orangutans are not very different from people. We should really be paying attention to this as a possible zoonotic agent. And last year, three papers came out based on our results showing that it can affect humans. Um, we predicted it. So uh, one in a kidney transplant recipient, uh, another in a historic case, and a third in a woman from Pennsylvania who reported uh, spending a lot of time with uh, fishers. I don't know what she was doing. I think she may have, may have been a wildlife rehabilitator. But it turns out that in elderly and immunocompromised people, uh, these aberrant infections can happen if you come into close contact with a definitive host. So um, we predicted an, a novel zoonotic agent before it entered humans. And I guess it's for that type of reason that I've developed sort of a street reputation around here for being a disease detective. It's a very flattering way of saying epidemiologist. So uh, thank you on Wisconsin Magazine for doing this. Um, but I guess you know, what, when one has that label, you're sort of expected to say something about why everybody fears these things, which is pandemics. You know, it's fine, it's not fine, but it, it's not the worst thing in the world if one animal in one corner of Wisconsin gets one strange disease. But if it starts to spread around the world and threaten global trade and global human health, like the pandemic going on right now, then we worry. And a question I get very often is, should we here in the frozen tundra of Wisconsin worry? And the answer is yes, we should, because we are by no means isolated. Uh, we get these things every year with the flu. Flu uh, breaks out in Wisconsin like clockwork every year. Most years it is uh, simply the seasonal flu, which is really a term for the mild form of a pandemic, because it's coming from Asia. Some years it's more severe, in which case we call it pandemic flu. But it is, it is a globally spreading disease. And then we have 
weird ones that hit people here in Wisconsin. Like, you may remember in 2003, the monkeypox outbreak. That was, again, how can you predict this? Gambian giant rats imported to Texas from Ghana uh, carried monkeypox and were sent in a pet, shipment of pets to Indiana and then to Wisconsin where it made people sick. So a, a, a virus from the rainforest of Africa um, infecting people in Wisconsin through the global pet trade and uh, through a Gambian giant rat. I mean, it's just very hard to predict these things. What we do know is that this happens often these days because of global transportation. Globalization uh, is a fact of life for us. You can't even see the US, let alone Wisconsin, in that blob of red. This represents connections among airports. Um, so it's not surprising things can get around. What are some of the other ways that these things might be able to get around and to Wisconsin? Well, this is a tick. And What's remarkable about it isn't that it's a tick, or that it's a tick of the genus Amblyoma, but where it was discovered. I don't know if anyone remembers this. This one was discovered inside my nose. <laughs> this, this is the famous Ugandan nostril tick. So this, about, about 10 years ago, eight, eight years ago, I guess, this was my claim to fame. No matter what I do in my career from now on, on my tombstone, it's going to say, here lies the nose tick guy. <laughs> I, I, I came back with this thing in my nose. Uh, I'd had a few of them before. They're not uncommon in Uganda, where I work, but of course, no one's heard of them here. I, I pulled it out, and I sent it to a colleague of mine at Texas A&M, who is a tick expert, Sarah Hamer, and she sequenced it. And the sequences were a no-known database. So what I had in my nose was a new species of tick or an old species that had never been sequenced. We're still not sure. Um, but it was a nostril tick, and this went viral. Um, I had a full page spread in The Guardian. I was in National Geographic, Science. Um, uh, I, twice I was on Lightning Fill in the Blank as a quiz question answer. That was perhaps the greatest of honors. But um, yeah, th this was my 15 minutes of fame because it was completely gross. And a scientist came back to Wisconsin with a tick in his nose. But what what the, the press missed, and I thought was the most interesting part of it, was just why did I have a tick in my nose? Um, with the help of some of my collaborators in this forest I told you about at the beginning, where the chimps were dying of respiratory disease, there, uh, there was a, a study going on to measure the age at which the molars of chimpanzees erupt. Because as anyone with kids knows, molar eruption, when they start to tease, is an is a important uh, important moment in growing up. So how do you do that in wild chimps? You wait for them to yawn and you take a picture of their face. 99% of the time you miss and they're looking away or their mouths are closed. So what we had was this gigantic photo archive of baby chimp faces. And we looked through them and found that about 20% of them had ticks in their nose. So you can see them here inside the nostrils up in there of these four chimps and many more. So what I had in my nose was a chimp tick. And for anyone who knows about chimps, this will make perfect sense. Because what do they love to do to bond their societies but groom each other? So if you're a tick out in the open on a chimp, you're dead meat because you're going to get groomed off and eaten. So you have to find a place to hide. There's a few places you could think of, but the nose is a really good one because it's warm, it's wet, it's vascular. So if you can get in there, it's great. And I'm pretty much a chimp with language. So um, the tick didn't care. It got into my nose, flew on a transatlantic flight back to Madison where I, where I discovered it. Now, as far, as far as I know, I haven't sparked any pandemics, but it's, nice, it's a nice example of how globalization comes home. Um, and I should just mention, because I, I love these types of stories, this is an evolution story. Chimp, tick, chimp nose ticks are not the only things that do this. This is, this is the chimp louse, Pediculus chaffee. It's unique among lice, because if you shine a flashlight onto it, it will let go of whatever it's holding onto and drop to the ground, which is suicide if you're a louse. But if you think about it, if you're a louse on a chimp, and another chimp parts the hair to groom, and the light shines on you, you better jump chimp and find, <laughs> find a new chimp, or else you're going to get eaten. So, this is, you know, I, I, in, my, in the School of Veterinary Medicine, as on this campus, there are 
researchers who are wonderful at studying all the intricacies of how viruses evade the cellular and humoral immunity of their hosts through these complicated biomedical, biochemical pathways and strange mechanisms. Parasites do this too, but behaviorally. They have adaptations like the microbes inside us to avoid host defenses. So I just like that story because it's another example of an evolutionary arms race with host and pathogen. So my intent here partially was to scare you by um, <laughs> letting you know that yes, we really do have to worry about emerging infectious diseases and there are more and more of them every year. I guarantee you that uh, Wuhan coronavirus will not be the last of the emerging infectious diseases that any of us see. Uh, these things are happening all over the place. And I often get asked, so what are you doing about it? Um, so I'll just hit very quickly on the fact that there are interventions being designed. You, you may have heard in the news that scientists are rushing to develop a vaccine. That's great, but that's not an outbreak response. That vaccine will be ready for the next outbreak. So the honest truth is that there are no magic bullet solutions for halting pandemics in their tracks. Once they've started, they, they uh, keep going. So you know, it's one of the unfortunate aspects of being an epidemiologist that when you do your job, nobody notices. Because if you prevent an epidemic or prevent a pandemic, how does anyone know? It's only when something breaks out that people say, well, you should be doing your job. Well, you know, I prevented seven pandemics last week. What do you expect of me? <laughs> um, but what we do in, the back, in, you know, in between epidemics and phone calls from the press about strange viruses um, is we, we try to do sort of basic public health interventions, things like education. In, in Uganda, we're, we have a new project called Healthy Children, Healthy Chimps, or HC squared, where we're trying to um, examine how these pediatric viruses are getting out of the children into the chimps and at the same time use it as an avenue for educating kids and their families about basic health, basic health care and basic health prevention. And for some of the emerging pathogens in Wisconsin, all I can say is that I'm working with the various agencies in Wisconsin that have established programs on interacting with the public. We can do things. We can do things like set management zones or put up signage or change the way we monitor. So not, none of it is like a vaccine that's gonna save everybody tomorrow. It's not like the movies. This is kind of hard, slogging public health that happens at a slow pace without necessarily the fanciest technologies. But the goal is always, of course, to restore the world to the lovely state in which it once was, once was we're all happy and healthy together, at least so we think. <laughs> There. I spared the dwarfs because they have magical dwarf immunity. <laughs> um, so I will stop there, except to say that this was, uh, all these projects are big projects of which I'm only a part, and I'm grateful to all the collaborators and funders who have helped over the years. And I would be, of course, happy to stop and take any questions. Yes? Your slide about emerging epidemics, or whatever it was, one was uh, deliberately emerging. Can you explain that? Oh, right. So the question was to explain my slide that, about, that the uh, WHO, I think, put out about emerging infectious diseases. And there was one called deliberately emerging bioterrorism. That was the anthrax in the mail of a number of years ago. So yes, that is, that is a mechanism by which diseases can emerge. And it's a very scary one. Um, you know, the, the, the agents where th there's a class of agent, uh, infectious agent that people sometimes study, including a few people on this campus, but it's getting rarer and rarer called select agents, which are considered to be extremely dangerous because they could be easily made into bioweapons. Anthrax is one of them. Um, so yes, that, that is a mechanism of emergence that we don't like to think about very much. I mean, honestly, we're scared of the human diseases, but as a veterinarian, I'm most afraid of foot and mouth disease being deliberately introduced into an American farm. That would be a crushing blow to the US 
agricultural economy. Yeah, in the back. Can you uh, speak about climate change and human uh, involvement in, in this? Uh, and, and from an historical perspective of uh, Americans using blankets with smallpox uh, as biological warfare, how, how has the, the, uh, the historic uh, perspective of these emerging diseases look compared to today when you, when you just went back to 1990? Good question. So how does, what does the historic picture of emerging infections look like? And your, your, your side question about um, smallpox lace blankets was true. So the, uh, there, there were incidents of blankets deliberately laced with smallpox or being used on people with smallpox being given to Native Americans um, to kill them. In fact, one of the more embarrassing aspects of my undergraduate degree is that I went to Amherst College and Lord Jeffrey Amherst, after whom the college was named, uh, engaged in that practice and they changed the mascot of the school as a result. We're, we're the mammoths now. Um, but the historical perspective is very hard to get at. Most people agree that this phenomenon of emerging infectious disease has been recent, within the last several decades. And people talk about drivers Globalization is one I mentioned. You brought up climate change. That's certainly the case. We're seeing shifts in vector population distributions. Mosquitoes going places they've never been before. Uh, ticks as well. We're seeing stresses on natural ecosystems that have not occurred before. So we think that climate change and similar global processes are fueling this somehow, but it's not a simple thing. It's not like the temperature goes up so you get warmer loving species. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's taking a, uh, you know, the deck of cards that is an ecosystem and reshuffling them, and what hand you get is very hard to know. If, if you can predict that, then go to Vegas. <laughs> oh. Yeah. How concerned are you about the possibility of CWD leading to CJD? Yeah, good question. So how concerned am I about the po possibility of chronic wasting disease leading to Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease? So for those of you who don't know, they're both the same type of disease. Chronic wasting disease of deer is a prion disease caused by a misfolding protein. Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease is a prion disease caused by a misfolding protein in people. And uh, they're not, they're, there's never been a direct link between them. There are other Prion diseases like scrapie of sheep, for example, or mad cow disease. Um, I should say that there is no evidence right now that chronic wasting disease of deer is zoonotic. The reason why we're concerned about it is through an abundance of caution, because we don't understand a lot about the pathogenesis of prion diseases, and because it takes a very long time for prion infection to lead to prion disease. So it's conceivable that we just haven't seen it in humans yet. But as far as I know, uh, there's no direct evidence for that. And in fact, there are good tests. So if you are concerned, you can get your deer tested. And if it tests negative, it's perfectly fine to eat. So my, my personal level of, of worry is, is pretty low, but not zero. That's interesting. So will, will my work come in contact with a coronavirus outbreak? Um, wish I could tell you. These things are hard to predict. What I can tell you, and what hasn't been in the news a lot about this Wuhan coronavirus, is that coronaviruses are so common. Um, oh, I don't know if I should tell this story, but I will. So um, I, I had a student, a student who was interested in studying coronaviruses in Africa. And it was just a pilot study. He never pursued it. He pursued something else. But um, he developed a test for coronaviruses that he was going to take to Africa with him. But he wanted to try, try it out on some negative samples before he left to make sure it wasn't going to cross-react. So he went to the bat boxes around Madison and got guano and tested it. And a lot of them were positive. So we, we named one of them like Madison hipster coronavirus because he was, a, he was kind of a hipster kind of grad student. Well, virtually every bat has coronaviruses. They're all over nature. When they're, and not just bats, rodents, uh, you know, 
pigs, there's coronaviruses all over the place. They're not a problem when they stay where they're supposed to be. They're a problem when species are brought together in artificial circumstances and when they can interact in ways they never would in nature and they have the opportunity to exchange coronaviruses which can then mutate and jump into people. So um, I don't think people realize just how common coronaviruses are. SARS, MERS, and this new one, it's not a coincidence because if you had to, if you, if you had to bet logically on what type of virus was going to emerge, you'd pick up coronavirus because there's just so many of them in nature. So maybe my chances are good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Tom. On those lines on the detection, can you tell us, was that an ELISA test or an RNA-based test that your grad student was doing? And what is the kind of test that the Chinese have developed in this six-week outbreak? Is that an RNA-based? Is it a, what, what kind of test is it? Yeah, so, so what kind of diagnostic tests did we use and what kind of diagnostic tests are the Chinese using? Um, they're, for the most part, RNA-based tests, reverse transcription PCR, they're molecular tests because they're very sensitive, very specific, and very easy to develop. So we were using that here. It detects the actual virus genome. Um, and it's, they're not at all difficult to design. The Chinese have, it, it takes no time at all, so the Chinese are using that. I believe they're also uh, using serologic tests or modifying serologic, so looking for antibodies as well. But um, to detect live virus these days, you would go right for the molecular PCR-based tests. There. Yeah? Uh, how would you contract Jacob's corpus? Well, Yaakov, and how, yeah. how long would it take to develop Oh, those are good questions. I may, I may need to phone a friend. But um, so, as I recall, there are two types of Creutzfeldt Jakob disease. There's the uh, familial form and, and the, uh, the, the aberrant form, or I can't remember what the name is. Spontaneous. Um, spontaneous, thank you. So, th there, it can be inherited as a genetic mutation. So, there's something in the gene that encodes for the protein that makes it uh, misfold. I don't remember exactly how old people are when they're affected, not when they're very young. So years or decades it takes. And then there's a variant, Kreutzfeldt Jakob, or, or a spontaneous, which you can get by direct transmission from infected people. And this, um, the, the archetypal story for this is the disease called Kuru, which was um, the first, I believe it was the first human prion disease to be found. But it, it's actually transmitted through the ceremonial eating of, of uh, relatives by certain tribes in, I believe it was Papua New, New Guinea? Is that correct? For the, so uh, yeah, there, there would be can, ceremonial cannibalism, and it was transmitted that way. Um, so it's very rare. I don't think anyone here really has to worry much about Kreuzfeld-Jakob disease. But um, these diseases are very slow. That's why it's been so hard to study them. Even in a mouse model where you inject a mouse with quite high concentrations of prion proteins, it takes a year and a half or two years for them to start showing clinical signs. So in humans, we're not sure. Tom. Um, in addition to the mammals that we've been hearing about, there was this story about possibility of coronavirus going through snakes. Hmm. Folks today at the School of Medicine Public Health and the School of Veterinary Medicine with their panel mm -hmm. um, threw a lot of cold water on it. said it isn't possible, but the evidence isn't much there. What other things besides mammals are we looking at um, that we need to be concerned about? So coronaviruses do occur outside of mammals. Um, in snakes, for example, uh, they don't occur in seafood. So this seafood market coronavirus thing, um, it's not coming from seafood. But the paper that claimed it was coming from snakes did um, sort of a, what I call a cursory analysis, and I don't think that's going to hold up. Everybody's betting on bats um, because SARS came from bats, and we know that bats host an amazing number of coronaviruses. But there have been some false alarms. MERS virus, um, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome virus, for they thought, oh, it's going to be bats, but guess what? It was camels. So who saw that coming? Um, so I, I am not aware of any 
zoonotic coronaviruses that have not come from mammals in the past. So I'm betting on mammals, and I'm, I'm playing the safe bet, and I'm betting on bats. But if it were something like a camel or a civet cat or you know some, some other small mammal I have never heard of at a Chinese live market, I wouldn't be too surprised. Any other right. questions? Well, thank you. If not, thank you.